Hello, I'm Adam. And I'm Adrian. And welcome to Cast from the Crypt. Today, we are talking about 2002's Resident Evil, the movie, of course, not the games. Yes, and uh, we're covering this because we are anticipating the release of a reboot film named Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City uh, very, very soon this year, almost 10 years later uh, after this movie was released. So uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to talk about this one. I am too. Do you know if um, Mila Jovovich, Mia Jovovich, I think that's her name, who plays the main character, Alice, do you know if she's going to be in the new one? She won't be. The new movie has literally nothing to do with any of these movies. I see. Um, So there is a Resident Evil franchise of films. I believe there are one, two, three, four, five. Oh yeah, six oh. movies. This one. Oh, it is five six. Sequels. Okay. Yeah, six movies. Yeah, there are six of these movies. <laughs> which... I couldn't believe there were six movies. No, I, I, frankly, I can't believe there was a demand for six movies. Frankly, it, it's rather shocking, but nonetheless, they exist. And uh, this first movie, it's a doozy. Wow. I mean. I, I thought maybe there were three, but six? That's so many for, like, this absolutely cheap franchise. The new movie, yeah. I think, is going to be more to do with the video games. I would say these movies are loosely correlated to the video games, and as right. the movies go along, they become even more uh, divorced from the video games. And already they take a lot of liberties. I haven't played Resident Evil. I've watched you play maybe the first level of the first game. Um, but I I know that these have nothing to do with the video games. Uh, they're starring this main girl named Alice, played by Mila, Mia, Jovovich, Jovovich. Um, and she's not in the games. She has nothing to do with the games. So in, in the the franchise becomes absolutely centered around this woman, and she's not in the game, so it's very not a faithful adaptation at all. No, not at all. It's also funny that she was cast in this movie primarily because she is Paul W. S. Anderson's wife. Yes, absolutely. I, um, I heard that, and I knew that going into this movie, that uh, the director... Um, What's his name? Paul Paul W S Paul W S Anderson. Yes, Paul W S Anderson cast his wife for this movie, and yeah, it, oh, I thought that was going to be goofy and dumb at first. But watching this movie, she gives it her all. She really does. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, to her credit, you know she's no chump. Like you certainly can center a movie around her. Yeah, she she gives everything she's got to this movie and this role and i (laughs) i I absolutely loved it now before we go into the plot and talk about the movie a little further i just want to talk about paul ws anderson yeah because (laughs) yeah good (laughs) uh it just seems like we can't evade this man he directed the 1995 mortal kombat movie which is better than the sequel certainly yes. it's not a terrible movie which um i would love to talk about that movie with you in the future by the way i would too i would too he's also obviously very well known for directing event horizon yeah uh and alien versus predator i'd uh, love to cover all these movies yeah yeah all of these movies <laughs> i really great, love them would be great additions to our catalog and then of course, most recently, he directed Monster Hunter. <laughs> yeah. He's known for bad video game adaptation movies. He also directed Pixels, starring Adam Sandler. Most people don't know that one. <laughs> Did he actually? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, man. I would believe it. I feel like Adam Sandler directed Pixels. Yeah, Adam Sandler, probably. <laughs> or someone. Um, one of his cronies. A few notes before we get into this movie. Please. First of all, this movie, um, I'm not, it's not good, all right? It's not the best <laughs> movie. It's very cheesy, kind of cheap, 
probably the worst CGI I've ever seen, uh, except for the CGI in um, 1995's Mortal Kombat. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> it had a budget of $33 million. And I would remind you that The Witch had a budget of $4 million. <laughs> and it still manages to look so much worse. Wow. Now, I'm curious where you found the 33 million number because i found 288 million oh 230 yeah i don't know where did you where did you find uh 33 i'm gonna look at imdb and we'll, we'll get to the bottom of this i i hope it was 33 and not 288 because this movie looks like garbage yeah 30 33 million okay i believe that number more yeah i, was I, I don't know say. where I, I don't know what i was looking at okay well Another thing before we get into the plot, this might be my new favorite movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. I loved this. I thought I was going to hate it. I thought it was not going to be good. And it wasn't good, but it was not good in every right way. It was a blast and a half. I regret that I didn't get to see this with anybody, but... Uh, I couldn't find it anywhere, so I had to bootleg it, so I couldn't really watch it with anybody, but wow. It's on Paramount Plus, I will say, but I don't have Paramount Plus. I bootlegged it. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry, I don't know who has Paramount Plus, uh, but shout out to them. Yeah, I found the reason I own this movie, I own it in a double pack with the second one, Resident Evil Apocalypse, because it was $2.00 for both movies oh, wow. at Walmart. And I just decided to pick it up because I, I, you know, I know we do this and I thought this is certainly something that we could cover. And just serendipitously, I found out that there was a new movie coming out. You thought might as well. Let's, let's get might into it. Might as well. I'm glad we did. Cause I'd love to talk about <laughs> how much fun I had. No. Yeah, me too. I, really enjoyed this movie and i'm actually really looking forward to watching the others i cannot imagine considering that this is and i don't know if you know this but considering that this is the highest grossing horror film series of all time no now it might have it might have been beat recently but up until i believe 2017 2018 it was the highest grossing horror film franchise you're kidding no no uh i, I look at resident evil's the, the first films gross alone you're right it's not it's not hard to believe that you know this movie is so successful um just looking at the numbers i mean i enjoyed it <laughs> and i i kind of understand the appeal at least after this first one i've gotta find this i'm looking this up surely i think the conjuring franchise yeah this says the conjuring franchise my info says as of 2017. Okay, yeah, this is... When when was this? As of this year, it's the third highest grossing. Still crazy. This grossed more than Halloween, Scream, Paranormal Activity even, just because they're a big franchise. It grossed more than all of those. Are you kidding me? People... Americans, I should specify. Americans love zombies, guns, and and beautiful women. <laughs> oh, do you? And this movie has all three of those things. And this franchise has all three of those things. Uh, my grandfather famously would say that a movie needs at least one of three things in order for him to consider it good. Those three things are horses aliens or bimbos wow <laughs> that's what he always said so wow <laughs> a simple man a simple man he knows what he what he likes he knows what he wants <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh yeah this movie <laughs> it doesn't have horses or aliens uh, nor, nor nor does it have bimbos i should or i should be clear please but it's got zombies and guns, uh, and I think that's what makes this franchise so marketable. I am certain that, just like us, there are hundreds of thousands of people that watched these movies in the theaters that had never 
even picked up a controller to play a Resident Evil game. Oh yeah, we're we're two of those people. Yeah, and like I have played a little bit of Resident Evil 2 as you mentioned earlier. And I can promise you I'm going to spend more time watching these movies than I will play in those games. Nothing against the games at all. Um but this is a really easy film to watch. And there are some genuine laughs to be had. I, again, I think we should be clear. This movie is a dud. Like it's not good. But that doesn't mean that it's not a fun, campy horror experience. Yeah, it's got absolutely everything I personally love in a campy movie and more. Like every single box it ticks for me. There is, first of all, just these people. This woman, Mila Jovovich, Mia Jovovich, whatever. <laughs> I, I, I apologize for the pronunciations. But she's the main character. She plays a girl named Alice. And she just looks like a video game character from an early 2000s horror game. Like, she's very, like, Silent Hill, Resident Evil, Laura Croft. Like, Samus Aran, that, like, badass woman who yeah. <laughs> is the face of a franchise. She's got, like, even her makeup and hair. It, this movie screams 2002 and i love that so much you know me yeah no i i know i do too i mean it's it's very of the times you pop in this dvd if you're me and it's nostalgic man she is you know uh, of course very conventionally attractive she is airbrushed to high heaven oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> um she's got piercing blue eyes it is Everything that made the 2000s the 2000s. Watch any TV show from back then. Watch any movie from back then. She is your protagonist. Um, this is not an endorsement of that, but it's very much of the times. Uh, it's simple. It is simple. This is simple fun. That's what this movie is. Yeah. And we've got a classic plot. Lab leak, zombies, uh, guns. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's the plot. We don't need to get into it. That's it. <laughs> That's it. That, um, uh, end the podcast. Yeah. I'll clarify a little bit more, I guess. The film opens with we're in the Umbrella Corporation's lab. And the Umbrella Cor Corporation is, is a part of video games, I know. That's probably the most uh, faithful part of this movie is the Umbrella Corporation. Right. But they're in an underground lab, the virus breaks out, the lab gets shut down, everybody's trapped inside, and everybody gets infected and dies. There's a great scene when all this chaos is happening, where, like, a fire alarm goes off and the sprinkler system turns on in one lab, but all the doors get locked. And it literally fills with water to the point that everybody inside drowns. And I thought that was the most ridiculous thing. <laughs> the water from a sprinkler system flooded and <laughs> drowned an entire floor. That's crazy. <laughs> what a... No, yeah, that, that is insane. It, it, it happened, like, immediately, too. Like, after it happened, two scenes later, they are waist deep in water. <laughs> like, like, they're in a submarine and the hole got uh, compromised. It was great. And then there's, once again, the year is 2002. This had nothing to do with anything, did not need to be included in the movie. I'm so glad it was, though. A bunch of people get trapped in an elevator, and there is that classic scene, classic trope that's so of the time where someone is escaping the elevator, and then it turns yes. back on, and they get, they get cut in half. That's the most 2002 thing I, I've ever seen. Like, uh, Final Destination had just come out. I'm pretty sure they do it in, like, a million episodes of a million TV show. I think they do it in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It was, like, such a trope at the time. And they just included it in this movie just because. Just to let you know it's 2002. Yeah. And, well, and if you think about it, it's so funny because I often think about the 
really, really nonsensical, irrational fear of elevators that people develop. Elevators, for folks listening, are incredibly safe. They don't fall a yeah. hundred stories, as movies will have you believe. That doesn't happen. That The brakes that are rigged to them, um, the way that they're engineered, that like never happens, ever. And yet, it is such a thing in movies from this era, from 2000, and I'd say 1990 to 2010, there's just so much elevator action. It, like you said, Final Destination is a great example. Um, and it really helped, it aided in, in the development of this really irrational fear for so many folks. Like, how many people have you heard be like, oh, elevators freak me out? Oh, I've known um, people that refuse to get on elevators. I hate those exactly. people, by the way. <laughs> get on yeah. the elevator. Shut up. No, it's 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 crazy um, to think that that's that movies like this, media like this, is the reason for that. It's also just crazy to think that this movie predates the zombie boom that we've seen in Hollywood. That I think is now finally ending. But the this movie, of course, predates The Walking Dead, at least the, the very popular television series. And I think The Walking Dead is really what made people zombie crazy. But no one gives Resident Evil that credit. I will say this movie started, this, or at least was at the very beginning of the, the it was. modern zombie boom. Yeah, no, I, it absolutely was at the very beginning. But I don't think people think back to it anymore. But the the folks at Constantine Film, who acquired the rights to the Resident Evil franchise, they were no dummies. They knew that they wanted to create a staple zombie franchise. And when they acquired the rights to Resident Evil, that's exactly what they tried to do. I don't know if you know this, Adam, but they, they hired initially to write this movie, George A. Romero. Oh, wow. Did he uh, do it? He wrote a script. And uh, eventually, he wrote a script, and I believe that Capcom gave the okay, but then something happened and they completely dropped him. So, like, they knew what they were doing, at least, or they knew what they wanted to do. They knew what they wanted this franchise to become. I don't know if they ever reached that point, because, of course, I've only seen the first movie. And, and now that they're rebooting the franchise, I guess that doesn't bode well. But... It's cool. It's cool to see the zombie boom in its infancy with this film. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly that time. And like you said, it's the most like generic classic zombie plot. Um, a lab gets infected. They go at the very spoilers. We need to do more spoiler warnings, I guess. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I suppose spoiler we should. Spoiler warning, by the way. We're going to talk about the entire plot. And I'm about to talk about the ending <laughs> right now. Um, the end of this movie sets up the sequel by having our hero Alice leave the lab and enter the city. And she finds that the virus has actually escaped the lab. And the city is now in ruin. The apocalypse has begun. Zombies are everywhere. And... You know, ruined city, infected lab. There's even a scene where zombies come from the ground, literally rising from the grave. It, it's just the most generic zombie plot. Uh, they, they, they have to figure out that they have to shoot it in the head at first. Like, you've seen this a million times, and this is, like, the most uh, tropey, campy version of that, and it's a blast. Yeah, and what I really enjoy about this movie that I think differentiates it from, you know, 90% of the zombie franchise, when you, or excuse me, of the zombie, uh, of zombie media, I should say. When you look at things like Night of the Living Dead, right, go back all the way, um, and the future sequels that they spawn, even the Zack Snyder reboot later on, uh, or if you look at The Walking Dead and the spinoffs that have come about, anything really with zombies, even video games, it usually shows an earth in ruin. 
and you know there there's a lot of imagery showing abandoned houses abandoned bases abandon everything now we do have an abandoned lab i suppose in this film but this movie really plays with that like early 2000s sci-fi as well there's lasers and there's advanced weaponry and um there's an uh, ai a ai yes thank you uh, there's there's genetic modification i think they hinted at at some point they really play with future futuristic tech um, in this film. And I don't know if they do this in the later ones, because of course, as you said, Alice walks out and finds a ravaged earth. But excuse me, I dug this about this movie. I think it really differentiates it. And I think uh, it, it made it rather enthralling because we don't just have a zombie invasion movie, a virus movie. Instead, we have a sci-fi action thriller movie where the zombies come out 30 to 45 minutes in. Yeah, I guess that's right. It's all atmospheric at the beginning. Yeah. And of course they want to build up to the like, there's zombies, you know, the movie begins with after the lab infection, we are introduced to Alice. She wakes up in a mansion that's completely deserted. And she looks confused. You can tell already that she has amnesia. And that will be an element of the plot for the rest of the movie. Uh, and she finds another person. Two other people, actually. One of them is a new cop who just got transferred to Raccoon City PD. And another guy named uh, Spence, I think. Right? Is that his name? Yes. Yes, Spence, who is um, also got amnesia. They're just like in this mansion, just looking dazed. And then, bam, a troop of commando marines comes in. It's the guys from Event Horizon. It's the guys from Aliens. <laughs> it's the guys from uh, Starship Troopers. And, um, of course, of course, it's 2002. Who's one of the commandos, Adrian? Michelle Rodriguez, baby. Of course Michelle Rodriguez is one of them. <laughs> Dude. Dude. When I saw her in this movie, I immediately just laughed my ass off. Oh my god, yeah, I saw her face. <laughs> she owned this era. She, yeah, absolutely. Like, between, between this franchise, or rather this movie, and... Every single Fast and Furious movie other than Tokyo Drift that she is in, uh, <laughs> she owned the 2000s. She did. She's in Lost 2 where she plays yes. the same character that she always plays. Yes. My, my favorite thing, I think, about the – any – my favorite thing, I think, about any action horror movie – within the 1980s to the early 2000s is there's always a Latina <laughs> in every movie. Uh, of course, if it's aliens, it's just brown face. Yeah, that's fair. But, <laughs> but, but at least in the early 2000s, there was a little bit of representation. Um, and, and who else but Michelle Rodriguez? Who else? I'm so glad it was her. That that was the icing on the cake for me. It was Michelle Rodriguez yeah. being in it. And, and she's great. She's great. She is classic. She brings uh, exactly what she brings in every other movie. I like to think this is just what she is all the time. She probably is. I doubt she's soft-spoken, you know? <laughs> yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> well, I guess we'll continue. Um... We get this scene where it's like a spinning camera <laughs> every time they oh. change to each character. And this is how they <laughs> explain what's going on is this moving camera that moves from each face of each person. And they're all standing in a circle. And <laughs> they are all God, responding. That is such a nauseating shot. Yeah. And it's once again, 
2002, the most 2002 thing I've seen, unabashedly. Yeah. And uh, we find out that, like, I think they, they put knockout gas in the facility and it makes some people get amnesia. Isn't that the explanation? Right. That's the explanation we're given, that the gas has those effects. Um, but then, of course, Alice, our protagonist, is the only one that seemingly remembers much. She remembers a few things throughout the film. She she begins to get her memory back, yeah. Right. Um, we find out that the facility shut down because the Red Queen, <laughs> which is what they refer to the AI as, the AI that runs the facility locked it closed and killed everybody inside so that way um, the virus would not escape the facility. And they're going in to... I think shut down the AI, aren't they? Yeah, they want to. They want to shut down the Red Queen, which is incidentally what they called me in high school. <laughs> they did not. <laughs> they did not I do wish. that. I wish. And we find out that everybody here, or at least almost everybody here, is actually secretly, well, I guess not secretly, is actually a member of the Umbrella Corporation. They all work for the corporation and. Oh, that's why they got to come in and fix everything, basically. They go underground, and of course, the you knew this. It was very obvious. The mansion is actually the secret top of the underground lab. Underneath the mansion is the lab. So they go into the bowels, and they go into the lab, and immediately they find this, like, little tunnel they have to go through, this, like, security gate, basically. And... <laughs> A laser beam. They they say this is a security system. It's literally lasers. A laser beam like uh, travels back and forth through this um, little security tunnel, and it chops almost the all of the marines into little tiny pieces. You were gonna. It's say your it. classic laser moving down a corridor, and the people have to play hole in the wall in yeah. order to survive. What a system, um, also. Yeah, but... What? <laughs> but not many of them survive. No, it, it kills, like, all of them immediately. Yeah. After this scene, there are three remaining Marines. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of shocking. Honestly, it, it surprised me because they set up a few of these characters, and they're all badasses. They're all more interesting than your average fodder, I'd say, your average horror movie fodder. And yeah, they, they kill them in gruesome fashion. One one of them, uh, one of the, the women, she gets her head just cut clean off and we get a hilarious shot of a CG stump, like <laughs> oozing blood. Yeah, and it's that classic, like, it cuts her head off and then she looks like a little concerned, a little disturbed for a moment. And then right. her head sl like slides off her body. <laughs> and then the the second Marine... He tries to evade the laser and attempts to jump. But when he jumps, I guess the AI autocorrects and just cuts him clean in half. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then the last kill is perhaps my favorite moment in the entire movie. Yeah. It's his name is James Shade. He's the uh, commander of these Marines and he is doing ninja tricks jumping over these lasers. I should clarify, the three re remaining Marines after this sequence are the only three Marines that weren't in this chamber. And I agree with you. I was surprised that they had all of these characters. They set up this like whole battalion uh, only to kill all of them off at the same time, like at the first obstacle. I really like that. It's bold. They do it in Aliens to kind of show you, like, how big of a bad the aliens are. This movie's kind of doing the same thing. Like, they're trying to show you how hard it's going to be, I guess. But the three remaining Marines are Michelle Rodriguez and another guy she went off with. The one Marine who literally is hacking into the security system. Welcome back. It's 2002. <laughs> There's someone hacking into the security system, and it is absolutely the BS, like, numbers on a screen. He's hacking. Yeah, and he's just pounding keys. Yeah. Like, 
just nonsensically. It's what you used to do when you would try to look busy when the teacher would walk by. It's just the most absurd typing. There is no commands going it being inputted. Nothing is happening. He is just like twiddling his fingers on the keyboard. Yeah, it reeks of a computer illiterate society that 2002 could have been. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by today's standards, anyway. Yes. And just before he shuts down the the security system and, and this laser system, the laser beam turns into a grid, a net, a wall of lasers that just dices him like mincemeat. And it's hilarious to me because I thought, why didn't the laser do that right off the bat? Why, why do the whole arcade game thing where we have to ninja our way over the lasers because then we wouldn't have had this great moment where he literally turns into pineapple chunks <laughs> and just like falls apart uh they do a close-up they actually don't show him in full which i question why considering they had the budget to show him in full um they they really just show like the corner of his head start to fall apart and then in reflection as Alice is watching him in the glass, you can see the reflection of him falling apart. It's not a great effect. It's also not terrible. It looks okay. Um, I mean, by modern standards, it's not good. But for back then, it's not It's not the worst. Um, but he just immediately starts to fall apart and, like, his chunks of meat start very slowly, like, falling out of place. And just for a moment, he also has that wandering gaze as though something is wrong. But they zoom in on his eye, and you see the whites yeah. of his eyes running like an egg <laughs> from the laser, which I loved. Yeah, I love any time like someone's literally been cut to pieces, but they've been cut so finely that they get to live for one second before they fall into pineapple chunks, like you said. It's so funny. I'm, I'm, I understand why they didn't show him. Because if they did show him, it would not have looked good. They wanted to kind of cover it up. And I, I respect that choice, I think. Yeah, I suppose it wouldn't have looked great. Uh, but I don't know. They didn't even... They later on do a quick pan of the hallway. And you don't even see his body. You see everybody else's. But you don't see the chunks. They didn't even know how to animate it or what yeah. it would look like. Nonetheless, That's, yeah, great kill. Fantastic kill, yeah. So they've hacked in. Everybody's dead. The remainder, the two civilians with amnesia, the raccoon PD guy, and the three Marines remaining all continue on into the uh, AI's chamber, the Red Queen's chamber. And the Red Queen appears. She she takes physical form as a little British girl that looks and sounds like the children NPCs in Skyrim. <laughs> I was going to say she's just like little English Greta Thunberg. Yeah. <laughs> Greta Thunberg looks like those NPCs, though. <laughs> yeah, she does a little bit. And, and she's trying to stop them she's trying to convince she's a hologram so you can't actually stop them but she's trying to convince them not to unplug her basically but they think she's been a bad girl so they shut her down anyway so when they unplug her it shuts down the power and because the power fails all the doors open i th i don't really see how but the that's what happens and because all the doors have opened, all the zombies are now free. And right. there are so many scenes, so many scenes in this movie where a crowd of zombies grab a person and you think they should absolutely be torn apart, but then they just kind of get away. Like that happens at least three or four times. Yeah, that's true. And like, there isn't a lot of, ravaging going on the zombies are kind of lame like resident evil zombies are interesting because you have like in the video games i mean 
you have the slow ones, and then you of course have like the freaky ones that split their faces open and stuff. Um, in this movie, they do introduce the liquor, <laughs> who, who we'll talk about later. Um, oh, yeah. But for the most part, all the zombies are really slow, really lame. Uh, the designs are pretty uninteresting. Um, and we, we also failed to mention that earlier on in the movie, we did say there's a lab leak, but somebody purposefully threw a vial of what they call the T-virus on the ground, and it went through the vents, and we watched the virus spread uh, all over the complex, or rather, all over the office space, the building. And those very same people that we saw exposed to the T-virus are the ones that are now unleashed in order to to drive the plot along and to kill these folks. It's always called the T virus or the Z virus or the something letter virus, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's always some sort of letter. It's kind of how hurricanes always have a name. Yeah, zombie viruses always have a letter. Well, when uh when when the doors are unlocked, Michelle Rodriguez and one of the other members one of the other Marines, I think his name is JD, encounter a zombie and they don't know it's a zombie. So they try talking to it and they're trying to reason with it. They don't realize it's undead and it manages to bite Michelle Rodriguez on the hand. So little does she know she is now infected, but that won't come to a head until way later. Meanwhile, uh, a little bit later, now that all the zombies are free, they're escaping a horde of zombies and they're shooting him. They're getting cornered. They're up against this door while JD is, like, trying to get the door open. They're hacking the door. They're breaking into the mainframe once again. Hacking. Fantastic. And I loved this scene in particular. He says, I, I don't remember exactly what he says, but he, he gives some one-liner because he thinks they're about to escape. And the door opens that he has his back against. And on the other side is yet another horde of zombies. And they all just grab him and tear him apart. And I love that. It's very much something you would see in a Romero room, uh, movie. Yeah, the way that they they almost like crowd surf carry him yeah. backwards. And then uh, it's rather agonizing for a second because he's just in the crowd uh, and they start pulling him all together, and they eat him like in a cluster, almost like a pack of wolves. Uh, they they like all at once start to tear him apart. Yeah, they, they don't really show much. They just show him. Yeah, you can't yeah. see it through the crowd, and right, right. Uh, but it's you can tell. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's still pretty gruesome. Michelle Rodriguez is trying to pull him out, but she can't. Everybody else pulls her back, and and they all manage to escape. Meanwhile, we find out that. Matt, who is the cop, the raccoon PD guy, he begins looking for his sister. We find out that his sister had secretly infiltrated the Umbrella Corporation and was trying to get dirt on them. They wanted to expose the absolute insanity and unethics that were going on in this facility. Um, but then the T-Virus got released, all this... Everything went to pot, and he finds his sister as a zombie. Uh, they have to kill his sister. It's very sad. And that's when he and Alice begin to talk. And we find out that Alice was her inside informant. And she, of course, doesn't remember this now, but when her memory begins to come back, she realizes that. Um, yeah, she she was a uh, like a security agent, and she actually worked for Umbrella. Yes. Uh, but she she forgot all of that because of the the Red Queen's special gas. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and while Alice remembers this, she doesn't tell Matt because Matt thinks the informant betrayed his sister, and that's what caused her death. Um, and it's really dumb. <laughs> doesn't make any it sense, is. but drama. Why not? Uh, yeah, when when they start to get into the relationships. Because there's another big twist in the movie. Uh, it's really dumb. <laughs> so they're, they're pushed back by the zombies back into the heart of the facility. 
where they the the commandos reveal that they actually only have an hour before the hive shuts the hive that's what they call the facility before the facility shuts down automatically and seals itself forever and they'll be trapped inside forever so they have an hour to escape so now the stakes are raised yet again there is now a clock a timer um and so they they decide that the only thing they can do is to turn back on the ai and see if the ai can help them at all which is very dumb again <laughs> Uh, they put a bomb on her on the computer, and they say, "If you don't help us, we'll blow you up." Is a kind of like, it's now a hostage thing. They're trying to force the AI to help them. Yeah, they refer to it as insurance. Yeah, insurance. Because <laughs> <laughs> of course they do. Um, and I think the AI tells them they can escape through the maintenance tunnels, which they then try to do, but then more zombies ambush them. So as they're escaping through the maintenance tunnels and the zombies ambush them, uh, of course, that classic zombie movie trope where the reanimated guy who used to be their friend comes back and they hesitate to kill that zombie because it looks like their friend. JD, who got eaten by that crowd, comes back and Michelle Rodriguez just can't bring herself to shoot him. Uh, then he bites her. And she shoots him anyway. <laughs> They're in the maintenance tunnels and a horde of zombies comes and floods the, the room they're in. Uh, and there's this big pipe that goes across the room. And Alice has the great idea to get everybody up on the pipe and they can crawl over the horde of zombies. But once again, classic trope, as they get halfway through the pipe, they've got just two people left at the back of this group and they're halfway through the pipe and the pipe breaks and swings down and they have to pull themselves up and crawl out while well, the zombies are trying to pull them down and it's you know <laughs> classic tense moment yeah and uh at a certain point in the tunnels uh just after the pipe breaks they end up being essentially separated because the horde has driven them into like different i suppose sections of like this underground system and <laughs> at one point alice is just i i guess i don't know exactly why but she's just like running around i suppose being followed but the horde is really only worried about the other folks like there's a whole like maybe 10 minute sequence in which Alice is just running around and has been able to be free while the others are just like literally there's a scene of her running around the corridor as one of them is contemplating suicide <laughs> with a gun in his mouth yeah it's crazy uh when when the pipe breaks one of them did make it across and he's stuck on the other side and he's like y'all go on without me <laughs> you know that's he's what trying, is. he's being the hero yeah and he's got one bullet left in his gun and he's like i'll do what needs to be done and they do yet another thing you've seen in a zombie movie before mm -hmm. where they leave him they hear a gunshot then we go back to him and we find out he took the gun out of his mouth and he shot a zombie with it and he's actually gonna try to fight this is exactly what happens in, is it Day of the Dead? Dawn of the Living Dead. Dawn of the Living Dead, yeah. yeah. This is exactly what happens at the end of Dawn of the Living Dead. And, and he tells them, he tells them, I'm going to make you work for your meal. Yeah, and, and he tries to escape. We cut away from him and go back to the main group. Alice remembers, her memories are coming back. And one of her memories, yeah, the conveniently, antivirus. so conveniently is that there is a antidote and it's somewhere in the lab. <laughs> yeah, so uh, as she's getting, you know, bits and pieces of her memories back, she remembers that there is what she refers to as the antivirus somewhere in the lab. And eventually she is able to locate where it's supposed to be located. 
but they find out that it is shocker missing because of course we need a movie uh and this is where we start to see that spence and alice have some sort of background they they certainly know each other each other well we find out later um but they both start to remember that at the same time that spence stole uh the antivirus and purposefully released the t virus and they show a flashback uh at the very beginning of the movie there is a scene in which a man in a crazed fashion, runs through the facility, knocks coffee into a man uh, just after releasing the T-virus. And at the very same instant, we realize that uh, both Alice and Spence know that this was Spence's doing. Uh, Spence purposefully released the T-virus. And I don't fully understand his motives. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. I like, have no... He's evil, I guess. I don't know... They. I don't think they really get into it, do they? No, not really. I mean, he's a thief who wants to steal it, but... I can't imagine a single situation you would release zombies on the world and, and benefit from that. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really interesting. Uh, there's a tense scene in which the little gaggle that we have now is all in a... Is it flooded? Is the room flooded? It, yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, they're all in this, you know, little tight corridor. It's flooded. And as Spence is remembering, he starts to, you know, point a gun at literally anybody that well, gets in his way. Yeah, It's a f hilarious and dumb scene again. They both remember Spence caused this at the same time. Right. There's one gun... <laughs> And they look at each other and somehow r realize the other one has realized and remembered. And they both run for the gun at the same time. And Spence just manages to get it before her. And it's so funny. It's so yeah, funny. It, like, a a exactly at the same time they remembered. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's exactly at the same time. We also find out that they are, they, they were romantic partners. Yeah. And, you know, for some reason... <laughs> They are just completely different, and Spence chose to be a thief, while Alice was a high-ranking security officer at Umbrella Corp. Yes, but she it, was trying to take it down from the inside, was working with uh, Matt's sister to, you know, expose their evil. She she listen, turned good. It, yeah. It's really nonsensical. Yeah. And how, <laughs> it's, it's not great relationship building. Um. But it's still really fun because this sequence where they try to build the tension is kind of hilarious. Spence is aiming his Beretta around in just crazed fashion. He doesn't want to kill Alice. That is clear. Um, and it doesn't seem like he's really serious about using the weapon against them. Oh, no, because so many times they just, like, get closer to him or, like, ignore the him yelling, stand still or I'll shoot. And he doesn't shoot them. Yeah, not once. Not once. It's it's a it's an empty threat every single time. Um, she eventually gets him to monologue about his I, I guess why he chose to do this. Um, which actually sparks like a pretty pretty funny moment with uh, Michelle Rodriguez where she says, Man, your boyfriend sucks or yeah. uh, or your boyfriend's an asshole, something along those lines. Um, but she does this, she starts to get this out of him because she sees in the background a zombie rising out of, uh, the shallow water that is now kind of like a rising around them or rather pooling around them. Um, and so she just gets him to keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. And just as perhaps he becomes a credible threat. Like, just as he starts to maybe consider doing something with his gun, this zombie bites him in the neck. Um, but he immediately turns around and, and kills the zombie. Uh, it, it, there's some sloppy editing in this portion of the movie. Did you notice that it's like a jump cut to him shooting the zombie? They don't even show the struggle. I, I don't, but I believe you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really kind of odd. 
And I'm trying to remember. Oh, he reanimates. I forgot about that. They always do. So Spence, of course, knew where the antivirus was. He's now been bit in the neck. Um, and as he gets the antivirus in order to save himself and leaving the others behind, he has now escaped the little corridor that was in that they, that they were in through a door and made his way to where the antivirus was hidden. He gets attacked by well, well, the liquor. He he locks them in the lab behind them. So now they're trapped in the right. lab. He's got the antivirus. Right. Um, and this is where he is attacked by, again. I'll say it again because I love saying it, the liquor. The liquor. Uh, <laughs> which, That's me right now. Uh, I have a lollipop. I'm the liquor. <laughs> they introduced the liquor a little earlier that he was some sort of, this might not be the exact phrasing, but like a prototype specimen that Umbrella Corp created. The liquor is very clearly the exact same liquor monster from the video games. This is one of the few uh, things that they brought over from the video games. The design is pretty cool when he doesn't look like just this complete Scorpion King-esque CGI monster. Um the liquor has like a brain exposed and he's all muscle and he's got sharp, jagged teeth. Um, they're bringing the liquor back in the new film as well. This is a character that's iconic in the Resident Evil franchise. But now that we know who the liquor is, shortly after Spence locks them in the corridor, finding the antivirus, the liquor descends upon him and just starts to tear into him. Uh, <laughs> and kills him and they watch it all on a tiny screen like it's all being televised to them broadcast live while they're in the room locked up there's a lot of choices made in the second act of this film that you could tell were just for spectacle very very shallow choices oh yeah yeah the, i mean most of this movie is just spectacle without a doubt well now he's been eaten by the liquor. They are trapped. The antivirus is right there. But they're trapped. Um, cue the Red Queen. She comes back. The AI. And she says she'll open the door if they kill Michelle Rodriguez. Because Michelle Rodriguez is infected. By this point in the movie, she looks very sick. She's doing really bad. Yeah, she's and, very pale. She's got a chunk of her hand missing. Yeah, it, it, it's the infection is so far along that it's not 100% guaranteed that even if she gets the antivirus, she'll come back. So the Red Queen is trying to make sure the infection doesn't spread and will only open the door if they kill Michelle Rodriguez. But just before they have to make that decision, who comes back but... Uh, Matt is his name? No, it's not Matt. Uh, the the other commando comes back, who we thought was left to die in the maintenance tunnels. And he's back. He didn't die. He escaped. He unplugs the Red Queen and opens the door. Yeah, his name is Kaplan. Kaplan. There you go. Sorry. Uh, there, There's a very dramatic reveal. The lab door opens and you see Kaplan there. And he has, he has shut down the Red Queen. Yes. In order to make his way in. And then they, the antivirus is on a train. I, for whatever reason, I, I guess he <laughs> moved it to a train. They're on a train now, <laughs> basically. And now they have to fight the liquor on a train. Yes. Uh, so they're on the train. They're able to get Rain, who is one of the other folks, and Kaplan both injected. Rain is uh, Michelle Rodriguez. Yes. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. Uh, Rain... And Kaplan, who just came back, they're able to get a dose of the antivirus. But then the liquor is there. He is able to really badly hurt Matt, um, digging his claws into him, and does unfortunately kill Kaplan. Which, <laughs> which is like hilarious, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, because Kaplan's been back on screen, I kid you not, for maybe five minutes at this point. Yes. No, it was he was like, I'm back, I live, guys, I'm here to save you. And then he opens the door and then gets killed. And, like, it's very unceremonious, too. I think the liquor just pulls him out of the train and that's it. Like in uh, Alien 3, 
<laughs> the xenomorph yeah. just grabs that guy and carries him away, and I guess he's dead. That's what happens. Just gets carried away. He's dead now. <laughs> so as they're struggling with the liquor, Alice is able to put a handle on him, but that's when stuff starts to, starts to take a turn for the worse, and uh, of course now Rain, who is on the train with them, Rain on the train, uh, we know that the antivirus maybe wasn't going to be affected, uh, or excuse me, effective. Sure enough, it wasn't. It failed to cure her, and now she is zombified, and uh, she unfortunately attacks Matt. Um, Matt is able to kill her, uh, but her head, as she as she like falls to her death, or rather, as she falls dead, her head hits a button, and the liquor is now released and falls under the train onto the tracks and is killed. Yeah, it opens and a door it's... that they push him out of and they like pin his tongue to the floor of the train. So he's being like yeah. dragged along outside of it, the train. There's a lot. I mean, there, there's really a lot going on in these final moments. And then there's a whole bit where they get to the mansion too. Yeah. They finally make it to the mansion I think um, Matt, the cop, and Alice are the only two survivors now. Then they're in the mansion. You think they're safe. A bunch of hazmat dudes come in. Uh, Matt has been, like, cut by the liquor, and it starts... The cut, like, mutates. It's, like, growing, I yeah. guess. And then uh, the hazmat people take them both away. Cut to black. They they do set up that they'll be in the Nemesis program. Nemesis is, of course, another very famous antagonist from the Resident Evil franchise. Um, this will be a treat for me because the only one I've played, I believe Nemesis is in. Or maybe he becomes Nemesis in the third game. I don't know. Um, but I'm really excited to see, as we watch more of these movies, <laughs> what they do with the Nemesis program. But but anyway, I digress. This is when we get one of the the final moments. Alice is a Alice being woken up. Yeah, she wakes up again in I have no clue where. I it, they act like it's a hospital, but it is not a hospital. Yeah, she wakes up in this white room covered in needles. She's on like a it's not a bed, it's like raised up and she's like tied to it. Like they're observing her. There's a one-way mirror. She pulls all the needles out in dramatic fashion. And then she just like, in the most bullshit lockpicking scene I've ever seen, she manages to lockpick a like card swipe, like key... You know, like a lock where you have to swipe a key card. She manages yeah. to pick that with a needle that was in her arm. I don't know. It was the dumbest thing. This, like, metal card strip reader got hacked with a needle. But whatever. <laughs> then she escapes. She sees that the city is destroyed. She finds, like, a destroyed cop car. She pulls a shotgun out of it. Chick, chick. Cocks the gun. And is ready to take on the world. Roll credits. That's the end of the movie. Yeah, we, we do get a slow pan out. Uh, I, I wanted to call it a drone shot, but I'm sure it wasn't back then. Um, but we, we do get to see the wreckage. More of that familiar zombie setting now. Yeah. Ravaged Raccoon City. What a fun movie. Yeah, I agree. Uh, certainly worth the $2 I spent on the DVD box set. The $1, really. You're right. You're right. The $1. It's um, worth the dollar if it made you laugh, made you smile. It made me smile. Uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun with this movie. I would highly recommend it. And frankly, like, I'm kind of itching to watch the rest of them. Yeah, I because, well, yeah. I watched the first 30 minutes of the second one, and then I fell asleep. And uh, we find out what happens with the Nemesis program. We're introduced oh. to some other beloved characters from the franchise. And the movie is not 
good. It's not. I don't think it's as good as this one or as enjoyable. But well, I'm sure of it. We'll I'm give sure it a watch. But with six entries, I'm sure there's bound to be at least two or three duds. The six movies gotta suck. There's no way it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Who but knows? Yeah. But I'm excited to find out. This movie's just fun. There's a lot of like action. Like a lot, it's just action. The plot doesn't really matter. It's just zombie action. Um, there's a scene we didn't even talk about because it is irrelevant, just like the elevator scene. But Alice is finding out she's right when she begins to remember things about herself. She finds out that she has this innate, just like really good fighting ability. She somehow is like a badass and is trained to like do ninja stuff. In this scene where she's chased by four zombie doberman oh my and god i love right. that scene that. she's like running around she finds a gun she shoots a bunch and then there's one that she ran out of bullets and can't shoot so she literally like parkour straight runs on a wall and like does a spin back kick and kicks this zombie dog in the face yeah and you can tell the zombie dogs actually look pretty good in my yeah. opinion well they're real and dogs well, I think they're real dogs in some of this. I do think that they switch off to CGI. Yeah. They, well, what happens is they do close-up shots of what I think are puppets. They're like just little prosthetic dog faces that right. look zombified. And then whenever the dogs are running, they use real dogs because it's in a blur. It's running. You can't really see it. And they clearly just put these dogs in like little red body suits. <laughs> yeah, it's very cute. Yeah, I love them. I I love in zombie media when they have other creatures become zombies because that's the one thing I feel like they never do. They always have zombie humans, but viruses can and usually do uh, transfer from some species to other species. So it would make right. sense that there would be zombie dogs. That's true. I love seeing zombie animals. So do I. I'll just, my final thoughts are these. Watch this movie if you can find it in a bargain for $2. Or yes. really, $1. Or it's, bootleg it. Or bootleg it, yeah. It's fun. Uh, pretty harmless. I think it's the kind of thing that you can watch with a friend uh, with relative ease. <laughs> oh, definitely. Watch this with a friend. Your 11-year-old would love it, too. Uh, I think it's really accessible. It takes no thought to watch very simple just action um i was incredibly inebriated when i watched this movie and i had a blast <laughs> watching it. yeah i was too and i also did <laughs> so uh so there you go maybe that's the way that you that's need to the watch way to watch it man watch it inebriated with friends yeah i agree i agree i'm excited to hopefully watch the uh, sequel with you, inebriated. Yes. But if that's all, I, I can't wait to watch and talk about the sequel. And thank you for joining me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Goodbye.